And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? Yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fucking quit. Fugazis. Fugazi. Fugazis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 454 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Hopefully, everybody's enjoying the summer out there right now. A lot of hot weather this weekend around the country. Hopefully, everybody cooled off. Mr. G, our producer, how was your weekend, my friend? Um, It was a tough weekend for me, all right? I'll be honest oh, with you. Oh, um, we don't want to hear that, G. I, I, had, I got food poisoning. Oh, yeah, Yeesh. it was tough. And not only did I get food poisoning, I probably got food poisoning in the worst place possible on planet Earth. I got food poisoning at DJ's. It didn't happen at DJ's, but it kicked in while I was at the bar DJ's down the Jersey Shore, which is a just crazy kind of like nightclub, super packed, super hot, super sweaty uh, bar where the bathrooms are also porta potties. So, oh, oh no. Yeah. So it was a very, very tough experience. So let me set the, set the, setting here and so i went out to dinner in belmar down the jersey shore and i was having i was uh i got i ordered sea scallops and i was eating the scallops and i'm just like I, i've been eating them my whole life and i'm like something does not taste right here something is something's off and when you know with fish like you know like i'm like something just isn't right i kept saying it the whole meal and lo and behold uh after dinner you know i wasn't even, didn't have a drink at dinner um after dinner we're like all right let's go get a couple drinks we, uh, you know, we, I go have a beer or two, end up at DJ's, uh, you know, two and a half, maybe three hours later, probably three, three hours later. And I go in, I order my first drink at DJ's and all of a sudden it just hit me like a, a thousand trains. It was horrid. It was my stomach just started fucking killing me. I started profusely sweating. I just instantly ran out of DJ's. And then while I'm outside waiting for my Uber, it was just a nightmare scenario because then I'm picturing, like I like I'm about to shit myself already. I'm I'm fully about to shit myself. I'm about to throw up. I don't know which which way it's gonna which come end? out, which end it's gonna come out of. So I'm like looking around because the Uber's taking a while. So I'm like looking for a bush. I'm like I'm gonna have to shit in a bush. I'm like I I, I don't know like I don't know what to do. Like I I I can't go back in the bar. I, the line's too long. I I I I, I, mean, I might have to shit, shit in a bush anyways. outside DJ's. And then all these scenarios start going through my head. I'm, I'm picturing Belmar, PD, and FDNY like hosing me off after they catch me shitting in the bush outside DJs. Just a nightmare scenario. Luckily, the Uber ended up showing up just in time. I get in the Uber. I go back to my girlfriend's house and just, just destroyed her parents' bathroom. It was, it was just a tough style. weekend for me. And, and then I had to go see my friends at Brooklyn Mirage on Sunday, like the next night. And I'm like, it was just, it was tough to go to an EDM concert when, uh, when you're coming off food poisoning. So it wasn't the best weekend for me, RA, but one thing I'll be honest that did help me get through this weekend was, uh, was your Oppen Oppenheimer blog. Oh, thank you, buddy. But for, for a real quick question, was it definitely the scallops that gave it to you? It was like, did you bite one and like, like didn't, wasn't cooked or something or just had a bad yeah, smell? Yeah, so the scallops weren't cooked. Like right when they came out, I got the scallops and I, I was like, I used to work in a fish restaurant, so let me preface by saying that. So I do have a good understanding of fish, how it should be cooked, how it shouldn't be cooked. And uh, I just was like, these, these baked scallops, they're not cooked at all. And I know scallops are supposed to be served pretty raw, but there was just something off about these scallops. First off, too, the oysters were just fucking terrible. Oh, terrible yeah. oysters. That's, that's when you know you're in for a bad seafood meal is when the oysters stink. And yeah, uh, yeah so uh, I, I, I knew it was the scallops because I... Uh, I, I even tried to give my girlfriend some. She's like, I am not touching those. She didn't get sick. I got extremely sick. And uh, yeah, I think I, I, it had to be the scallops. It, it absolutely had to be the scallops. I'm not going to throw the restaurant under the bus, but nah. yeah, sometimes man, getting food fault. poisoning in a, in a packed like nightclub, sweaty beach bar is just the absolute worst nightmare scenario you could imagine. Yeah. Guys, we're here. And you know, it's time to talk some Pink Whitney. Spitting Chickle's own Pink Whitney. The birdie juice, the sailing juice, the 
the fishing juice. You can use it in any single aspect of your life besides driving. The best drink of the summer, of the fall, of the winter, of the spring. It don't matter the season. Listen, I got a lot of people in my DM saying, wait, you're talking about Pink Whitney. You're talking about Pink Whitney all over the golf course, all over the beach. How about us lake people? I'm not ever going to forget the lake people again, the pontoon people. It don't matter the event. It don't matter the people you're with. You can be alone. You could be in a group. You could be at a party. Maybe talk to a girl they were too nervous to talk to because of that pink drink. Give them a little confidence. You could be at a graduation. Pink Whitney's where it's at. All sizes, one flavor, one name. Pink Whitney. Thank you very much. Oppenheimer, man. I went and saw this uh, the first day it came out. It actually was Friday was the day it actually came out, but they had those preview screenings on Thursday. And I got my ticket well in advance. I mean, I saw this preview seven months ago, and I don't really circle too many dates for movies anymore. There's just not a lot of good stuff that comes out. And Mike, I can't tell you the last time I was blown away. I mean, you read the blog. I think I conveyed my feelings pretty well on that. Uh, just a stunning movie. Um, you know, I, I know we see all these movies about the apocalypse and zombie apocalypse and, uh, uh, you know, like dystopian flu uh, vaccines and all this shit, vaccines, uh, you know, viruses or whatever. This is about the actual fucking apocalypse. This is about, you know, the earth blowing itself up because of, of, of mankind. And obviously, you know, it's 2023. We're all still here. We know, like, how the movie pretty much turned out. But for a movie that, you know, no, it's not an action movie. There's, there are some scenes that you're on the edge of your seat, but Mike, I never had a movie that grabbed me, like I said in my video, by the collar. It just like kind of shakes you for three hours uh, because you know what the stakes are and you realize, oh my God, I didn't realize how close we were. Like for, you know, when they tested the first bomb out, like they were pretty sure how it was going to go, but there was a possibility that it could have been a lot worse, like where the whole atmosphere could have caught fire. And, you know, they didn't know they could have, they could have ended the earth with that test when they were test testing out the nuclear bomb. It's not really a spoiler alert. It's pretty well known. Um, but it, it was just a stunning, a stunning achievement for a, for a movie that Christo Christopher Nolan did because, of, again, because of the topic, because uh, the whole world changed then. And Oppenheimer, you know, he didn't invent it by himself. That was another thing. It was educational. He was kind of almost like the general manager who went out and got all the, the good scientists, brought them in to the Manhattan Project, which is the pro secret project out in uh, New Mexico, to, to, to design, to come up with the idea, and then to actually make the bomb. I mean, science beyond our level of comprehension. I mean, me and you... We not the biggest, you know, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> of course. A nuclear bomb over here. that's way out of my range. And, and you know, of course, it, it was like, okay, the Nazis have it. They're two years ahead of us. So now we, we have to catch up to the Nazis and, and get ahead of them. And, and there was a great quote Oppenheimer says, you know, he goes, I don't know if we can trust ourselves with this. He goes, but I know we can't trust the Nazis with it. And I was like, you know, they, it was, I know everyone's second, what is it, uh, Monday morning quarterback, and especially younger viewers who, you know, who were finding sympathy for the, for the Japanese here. And, you know, there's obviously a horrific element to, to nuclear weapons, but I think a lot of the current movie going audience has the inability to kind of put themselves into that era and how things were. I mean, the you know, world was at war. I mean, people were coming to kill, kill us and take us over. And, you know, that, that's, it was a survival technique. They had to like figure out and how to survive. And I know people, oh, they didn't have to drop it or they had to drop it. I'm not really debating the merits of, of at that point in the war, but you know, he was, he was tacked with, with making this thing, putting a team together. Uh, but the acting man, you know, Killian Murphy, I know I got, I, I called him Cillian before. I've heard it pronounced both ways. I thought it was Killian Murphy. I'm, that's what I'm going to go with. I mean, I've been watching this guy since 28 days later. Phenomenal performance. He's definitely going to get a, 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 an Academy Award for, um, nomination. At least he should win it. I mean, I don't know what Leo's going to do in that Scorsese movie later in the summer. Just a phenomenal performance. This guy, he lost a ton of weight. You could just see the weight of the world in his face, just in his acting. Uh, Matt Damon was great. At Robert Downey Jr., like I wrote in the blog, I think everybody got used to him being Iron Man for the last 15 years, and they either forgot or didn't know that this guy's a tremendous actor. I mean, he was nominated 30 years ago for Chaplin, uh, Robert Downey Jr. Great flick, by the way, if you've never seen it. Phenomenal performance by him. Uh, Emily Blunt, you know, she's kind of always, you know, always smiling when you see her in Preston. She was like kind of a, a, a grumpy, alcoholic uh, wife in this one. She was tremendous in it. Uh, but then you look at all the side characters. I mean, there were three actors, uh, I won't name one of them, who won Academy Awards for acting. And they had uh, what were essentially bit parts of this movie, almost like cameos. So that's like, I mean, Christopher Nolan comes calling. People, like, they take less pay. All these big actors, they took way less pay to be in this movie. And I walked out just stunned. Like, it, it was like the quality of the movie, how good it was, the writing, the directing, the sound. I mean, uh, I forget how to, how, how to pronounce the composer's name, but the, the sound is there the whole time. It's almost like you forget about it. And that adds such an element, like, of, of making you, like, on the edge of your seat, you you feel the stakes of what's at what's at, at play here, uh, largely because of the movie. Uh, but the supporting cast is, was incredible. Like two guys, like remember Josh Hartnett? No, I remember he's no, he's still with us. But in Pearl Harbor, 
I yeah. haven't seen this guy in anything lately. This guy, he looks fantastic, first of all. He was incredible in it. And the guy, David Krumholtz, who's like the epitome of a character actor, you've seen him in tons of things. Awesome. Those two guys, they're probably not going to get nominated, but they, they definitely deserved it. Uh, and the feedback, man, uh, you know, when people say oh, it was boring, uh, it was long, it's like, hey, man, it, it tells more about the people saying that than it does anything. Like, oh, like that dope we work at. I like Steven Shea, but like, roll that, roll that, that dope's clip. All right, coming out of Oppenheimer, quick thought. It is a sheep in wolf's clothing. I thought it was going to be an action movie all about war. It was for about hour 45-ish. The last hour and 15 minutes is fucking C-SPAN. It is a courtroom case. Part of it's in black and white. Uh, it is just not what I thought at all. Um, Dr. Robert Oppenheimer obviously met the atomic bomb. Um, interesting story around that. I'm not sure it was very well acted. It was fine. Not a ton of character development. He seemed like kind of a dickhead. But brilliant. Um, the last hour 15 could have done without could have completely cut out and it would have been a much better movie um the fact that we had to listen to this kangaroo court hearing about his character ridiculous terrible made the movie not repeat watchable you're not going to want to recrotch it it was all right also the trailers i don't know if just the theater i was at like we got two previews i want to see like five six previews we got, we got two if no shade to my local theater, though. I mean, Steve J. I've known you as long as anybody at the company. Big fan of you, Oz. But what the fuck are you talking about? Like, I thought the acting was so, so... I mean, dude, this is about to sweep the Academy Awards next year. I mean, there's a long way to go. But how can you say the... I guess the acting was okay. I mean, this is like career best performances from people. Uh, I thought there was going to be action. It was a war. It's like, where did you think this is a World War II movie? The fucking title is Oppenheimer. It's about the guy. It wasn't just about, okay, we made the bomb, movie over. No, it was about... You know, the, the fucking, this guy was the hero one day and then they turn him around and they, they kind of, now he's not the hero anymore. It was his whole guy's life, his whole life's work. Uh, all right, again, all right. I, I have, so, I have I so many up. questions here. All right, fire so away. First off, you just cut me off. I, I've seen so many people online talking about like making jokes about like the 70 millimeter and like that's how, like, like what's going on? Like how should this film be, be viewed? Whether it's IMAX, what is this 70 millimeter stuff? Like, it, can you kind of just explain this to me? Yeah, seventy millimeter was it's it's just a style of film. A lot of people, directors don't really use film anymore, and there's very few theaters that can accommodate a seventy millimeter reel. Um, it's just it's real cinema nerd stuff, and I'm I'm probably not the best guy to break it down. It's just like a difference in quality, the way it comes out the screen, the way it projects. It, I mean, again, I'm, I couldn't really break down the actual specifics, but it's a better like a better experience to see it somewhere like that. How did but you pro- How did you see it? I saw it on the IMAX up in Reading, Mass, at the Jordan's Furniture in Reading. That is actually the best screen in New England. It's the biggest IMAX it. screen. I love that. I love that place. There's IMAX and then there's what, what's called LIMAX. And me and Whitney fought, fought about this in the show one time. It's IMAX. There's the real IMAX. There's the way they're intended to be seen. And then there's like what they call LIMAX, like over the Boston Common Theater. They, it says IMAX, but it's not real IMAX screen. It's not the real IMAX experience. They they use the IMAX film for uh, film reel for it, I believe. So it's not the the real IMAX experience. But that's where I saw it. I mean, the sound, the seats are rumbling, just the th- you know the whole screens in front of you. I would suggest if you can see IMAX, real IMAX, go there. Uh, if you have the opportunity for seventy millimeter, go there. And there are only thirty, I believe, thirty places in the world where you could see it in IMAX and seventy millimeter. Like that's like the combines the two best versions. And I might even go out of Providence to see it a second time because Providence has one of these theaters to see it. Now, having said that, I when I did my little one minute review. You could watch this on a 13-inch black and white TV, Mike, and I think it would have maybe not 100% the same effect, but it, it will kind of punch you in the, in the face. Like I said, the, the ending, the way he wrapped, wrapped it up, and, you know, Christopher Nolan, he's a fan of what they call nonlinear storytelling. It's not straight through it. He jumps from one timeline to another and back to this one. And it's not like, uh, you know, Tenet or Inception where you're like, oh, what the fuck's going on here? Because, you know, you, you guys have gray hair in one scene or they, they look younger in another. It's pretty easy to follow. And it, it, but the way he like kind of masterfully weaved them all together, so when it all wraps up in the end, you're just kind of like, oh my god! It, it just from a from a like a script and filmmaking uh, perspective, it was like mind blowing. And then when you go and watch what the actual scenes were and what gets said in them, I mean, I was flabbergasted at, at the end of the movie. It just absolutely like jaw dropper. Uh, and you know, I think I, I said put it right in the headline, man. It, it's kind of it's a movie. It's odd. Everyone will ter- interpret it a different way, but 
I was kind of like, man, this is, it's scary. It's kind of scary. And it's just kind of a reminder of this is the world we live in. I know your generation didn't grow up with the Cold War. Like, I mean, we grew up, man, in the 70s and 80s. We didn't know if the Russians were going to bomb us in a minute. Like, it was kind of a scary time. And until, the, you know, the Berlin Wall fell and, you know, the Eastern Bloc fell and all that stuff. But for this, I mean, 70s and 80s come out. There was the movie The Day After. I'm not sure if you had heard of it. It, it, it imagined the nuclear holocaust in America. I mean, it was horrifying. It, it, it was on in 1984 or something. So we grew up with with this fear. So I, I don't know if like, you know, younger kids or younger generations didn't have that. So maybe they, they, they're they not relating to the material as much. But uh, I know I'm going along here. I couldn't I couldn't recommend it enough. Go see it. If you thought it was too long, too boring, uh, I guess that's on you. Maybe you're not ready to see the movie. But uh, A plus uh, full box for Oppenheimer. Go see it if you can. All right. So without giving too much away in the movie, and like you said, this is a true story, so it's, there's really not many spoilers that you can give away, but like, tell me about this Oppenheimer guy. Like, I, I've been seeing on Twitter that like, he's, he was a lunatic. Like, he was just like a crazy person. Like, he was, he like attacked his, I think the dog walk was talking about how he like attacked his friend after his friend said he was getting married or something. Like, can you just tell me about this Oppenheimer guy? And was he just like a, like, I, be, be, before any of this, I thought he was just like a, a scientist and like, like it seemed like he lived like a really crazy, interesting, not demented, but crazy life. I mean, he, he's definitely a complex fella. I mean, there's no doubt about complex, that. Complex, that's the word. Yeah. He's certainly a complex. I mean, I think you know, a lot of people, that's not a huge thing. A lot of people are complex, like my, myself, I guess you'd say, but he was, you know, he was a, a, a brilliant physicist, brilliant scientist, and I guess it was quantum physics was, uh, was a relatively new field after Einstein, you know, uh, has the theory of relativity. He was a brilliant mind. Now, I, I'm not a science guy, a science history guy, but, I, you know, I went down some, you know, Twitter threads or whatever, uh, Instagram, and, you know, like the science nerds were arguing, you know, who's the best scientist ever. And I, I guess he was a pretty brilliant mind, but he, he didn't, he could have been uh, like uh, all timer as far as like quantum physics, but. You know, like I said, he didn't go in a room by himself and invent the bomb. He put all these scientists together um, and got them together. I think he he was uh, he was kind of fucked up. They do show one scene in the movie where I was like, holy shit, like, he he does something like, oh, this guy's fucking it, it, crazy. And then he he sort of uh, undoes it so it, it didn't didn't play out the way it was supposed to. Not nothing to do with the bomb. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, he was a, he was a sex addict. I guess he was always running around get, getting ass on the side, and he was definitely uh, you know a, a, a different guy. And I think the movie was showing that. You know, they didn't deify him. They didn't make him this like oh this god like figure. They showed him as a as the flawed man he was. But I don't know that he was like a, like a lunatic. I, I think he he was a guy who had interest in a, in a lot of different things, and he'd be willing to hear them out. Like the the knock on him when, was that he was a communist. Like they didn't want to bring him into the fold, though. He was suspected of communist activities. Well, you know, he back in the twenties and thirties. I mean, people had friends who were part of the communist party. I know. You know, people that tell you all commies, blah, blah, blah. It was a different time. There were Americans who, you know, formed like groups to talk about it. And he was just like a, an intellectual, curiously, per, uh, yeah, inte- intellectually curious. But uh, yeah, he's definitely uh, had some, I don't want to say uh, skeletons in his closet, but I thought the movie showed like, you know, this guy's not perfect. And, you know, he just, you know, he, he changed as his life went on and different ideas and stuff. But I, I thought that the flick showed that. But as far as like a, being an absolute nut, I, I don't, I maybe he was if you read the book. I didn't really see that too much in the movie though except for that one scene early did you uh you catch barbie at all this weekend or you just see oppenheimer just oppenheimer i didn't i didn't do the bot was it bobbenheimer thing I, barbenheimer. I'll, see, I'll definitely see bobby too i mean when, when they first making it i was like oh man you know it's kind of you know the goofy uh intellectual property movie but i'm definitely gonna see it though at some point i mean i know people you know, a lot a lot of guys that seem to be threatened by it whatever it's a fucking movie go see it and yeah i'm gonna look forward to it it's not like on my number one to-do list though all right, speaking of stars, we will have some stars at the Chicklets Cup in Buffalo, which oh, registration baby. goes on sale this week, Tuesday, uh, the 25th is the pre-sale, Thursday, uh, the 27th, it goes on sale to the public. So it's Biz's last Chicklets Cup. Uh, Colby and Merles, they, they're going to do like a game notes team. Like this, It's going to be so much fun. There's rumors, all right, there's rumors of a maybe potential mini basketball court where there could be a free throw competition against RA. No. Uh, I'm very excited. I love, I love rumors. Uh, if, hey, if Game Notes is looking for a team, man, I, I tell you, those London boys we saw play, there's some gunners on there. I don't know if they're already roller, coming to though, the tournament. It's, it'd be roller, so I think it would be for Team Barstool. Okay, okay. All right, these guys played street. I don't know if they're interested in roller, but no, that's awesome, man. I mean, I'm retired. I'm, I'm all done after I cracked a rib or whatever the hell I did up in Detroit, but I can't wait for Chicklets Cup, man. I can't wait, get, wait to get back to Buffalo, so Again, she just said registration coming up. Uh, what else is going on at the Chicklets Cup? Same old, same old? 
Same old Eddie. October 6th and 7th are the dates. Uh, you know, Thursday reg- registration party. Uh, yeah, and then October 6th and 7th, we have so much stuff planned. It's only going to be bigger and better than last time. So again, yeah, we, we can't wait for the Chicklets Cup. Tuesday, it goes on sale. It's the pre-sale. And Thursday, it is, uh, it's open to the public. Uh, Gia, what question I saw from, from uh, a few people, like we, we don't register singles, like people who want to play, right? Like that's not an option. Like if people want to play, they can put their name in. Is that, is that something that folks can do? Like in other words, a guy is a team, doesn't have a team, wants to play. He can't just st- sign up as a single. Can he? No, we've done that in the past. Um, we've okay. done like a, basically like a free agent team, but um, you know, with the, with the demand, basically it's, it's kind of just been too difficult to do that. It, it sells out too quickly. So, yeah. And that's um that I, I don't, it, we should definitely emphasize that start getting your teams together. You have to, you know, you, you have to have everything dialed in when you sign up. So start getting stuff together because it sells out incredibly quickly. And, uh, you don't want to miss out on this. I'm telling you, it's going to be unbelievable. And like we said, it's Biz's last Chicklets Cup ever that he's playing in. So win or lose. So uh, it's it's going to be a blast. Yeah, I can't wait for it. I can't wait to go over that bridge and smell Cheerios first thing in the morning when you're taking that little bridge over to the Kelly Island or whatever it's called, the Buffalo. Awesome time. Uh, you just mentioned uh, stars. Well, this next guest we have coming up, he's a definitely a, a spitting Chicklets all-star. Uh, legit, one of the funniest interviews we've done. I teased it. Uh, is probably one of our top five funniest, and we could we got to get this guy back. He was absolutely hilarious. I don't think we really scratched the surface with him, but we're gonna send it over right now to Brian Boucher, longtime NHL goaltender and a uh, hilarious fellow. So enjoy Bush right now. This interview is brought to you by Chevy. Chevy is working to make charging simple. Gang, I'm not, I'm not sure if you saw the ad we did a few months back. We did all the podcasts at Boston. We got together. We checked out these Chevy electric vehicles. They're incredible. They're beautiful on the outside. The technology inside, incredible. Way over my head. I couldn't believe it, but these electric vehicles Chevy is doing, unreal. They got over 110,000 charging stations across the U.S. and Canada, still growing. The My Chevy app? Your smartphone becomes your co-pilot when using the My Chevrolet mobile app with energy assist. This thing is incredible. The app allows you to access vehicle information like your battery status, charging sets, a whole bunch of other things from anywhere. Doesn't matter, man. And the energy assist feature intelligently plans your routes, tells you where and how long to charge up, and gives you real time data about charging station availability. This stuff is incredible, man. I grew up, I drove like a whatever kind of car I can't years ago. Oh my God, the technology blows me away now what you can do. As far as the home charging, there's three different levels available Chevy electric vehicles, they got great options for charging, and all of them as simple as plug it in your smartphone. And again, if you saw that ad that us, our podcast did with all the other ones a few months back, these vehicles are gorgeous, all kinds of colors. Whatever you want, pick them out. Chevy hooks it up. You can learn more at chevy.com slash electric. All right, it's time to bring on our next guest. This Rhode Island native was Philadelphia's first round pick in the 1995 draft, and he made the all-rookie team after his first season as a flyer. He went on to play 13 NHL seasons for seven clubs. And these days, you can hear him break down the games on ESPN. It's a pleasure to welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Brian Boucher. Thanks for joining us, Boosh. This is a career highlight for me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to tell you right now, you guys are all legends. I love it. Not (laughs) not having the longest uh, NHL shutout streak. Do you still own that? I do. I don't think that's getting touched. How many games is it? Over four? Three, it was 332 minutes and one second, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> would you, would you, you say, actually in the craziest zone ever then? Like, it, do you remember yeah. just being like, holy shit. Like, it's what like, were you on? It's like clear the mechanism. <laughs> Red Bull. Yeah. And Sudis. Yeah, yeah Sudafed. Like Everybody was on yeah. fucking Sudis. The Sudis. <laughs> yeah, and Vioxx. Remember Vioxx? No. No. Yeah, that was pain, pain reliever. Yeah, or I guess yep. it was blowing people's hearts up. I was on that. The anti-inflammatory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah. I remember that. Did that with Sudies and Red Bull and let's go. <laughs> yeah, you can't the, score on this guy. Hey, hey <laughs> that's Bush, the Bush concoction. Through your career, ups and downs. You know that that moment though. Did was that? Did you find? I wouldn't say the pressure of keeping it going. It was just happening for you. But was that like the easiest thing you've ever done? Almost because when you're in that. It just everything's hitting you. Everything's ha- like you're. You must have been sleeping like a baby a bit. And uh, I well, like the first three games, yeah. Yeah, you're. Like, I mean, you're shit. just like you're seeing the puck. Everything's great. Your reads are unbelievable. You think, <laughs> oh, this is great, you know. But then when you get to like game four and people start talking about a record, I was like, whoa, I, I had no idea about this record. Mm-hmm. And we're on we're on a road trip the whole time, and we had a rookie dinner. 
Oh. <laughs> oh. In Washington. In the midst of it or to start so it? I think you should add at least two games. Yeah, yeah. no shit. <laughs> yeah. Another 120 minutes because we had a rookie dinner in Washington. Um, yeah, so it was wild. Guys tightened up, though. They, These guys, were they, they were shitting themselves, you know, in the locker room. They couldn't wait for this thing to be over with. Like yeah. your, your teammates. Oh, yeah, yeah. They were, like, guys were, like, so scared to turn. This was, yeah. like, January when, like, the, you know, nobody cares, right? And yeah. Guys have to like buckle down and block shots and not turn yeah. the puck it's over. Like, Don't yeah, take yeah, exactly. Like, would you just let one in so <laughs> yeah. we can get back to living? That's so like it was a, the second period of the sixth game. Three hundred thirty-two minutes. Oh, what it did? It started uh, in relief. I came oh, in, okay. in a game in Nashville. So though, and I actually gave up a goal with one second left at the end of the second period, and I came in for relief. Sean Burke got hurt in Nashville, and so if I if I didn't give up that goal with one second, it would have been longer. Wow. Yeah. And then it continued after Christmas and through New Year's. So was it one of those a, things a, where uh, even that too? Where, you, oh, I, was, I was just saying, was it one of those things where like, you know, you had this incredible run and then like the game after it broke, you gave up seven or something like Buddy, that. <laughs> the wheels <laughs> came off like you would not There's a believe. crack in his armor. Oh it's opening God. up. <laughs> and they had like this ceremony for me uh, before a game yeah. and they knew not to play me after that ceremony because I was, I just wasn't ready. Yeah. And yeah, the wheels fell off hard. If you looked at my goals against after that, I mean, I think I gave up six, five, <laughs> got yanked. Save percentage was through the roof. I was thinking like, oh my God, extension. This is gonna yeah, be Yeah, I was gonna ask that. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna crush it. And then I came right back down the reality. I think I finished the year just above nine hundred. <laughs> Oh. It's so funny though. That's my nightmare fuel of like playing. Is like your life is so good for a week. And then one week later, it, you could be. Well, like, you're a the, spaz too. I'm, you're a, like, yeah, I'm you, a mind dude, fraud you, army, dude. I saw a guy yeah, in the street. Biggest mental midget Some guy in the, in the street goes, "Army, you, you you look like you had a great time last night." He's like, "What? What do I look like? Oh my god, yeah, I look bad. Out. Do I look bad?" I'm like, I'm like, my wife hates Christ me. My kids army. think I'm a loser. Oh my god, I'm going home. I shut the curtains in a black cave and just laid there. <laughs> Were you guys playing before the lockout? Um, yeah. Um, no, I actually my my first year in the minors together. We all were. Yeah, minors. All right, because I had a game against Pitt. I didn't know if you guys were there. They were like the worst team. They're the worst. Yeah, I was, worst was on, that, I was on, that, on that, team? that team. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I was. I'm telling you, I was tanking. We tanked. We tanked. To I, get I think Ovechkin, lost, but we lost the lottery. Right. I think you guys had like lost 15 in a row. You yes. came into Phoenix. Is that when Edzo lost that game? Yeah, we won. I think. Was, uh, but, Eddie, was it, Edzo your coach? Yep. Yeah. And we, this is how bad well, that was. We were. Kyoto. Kyoto came and yeah. like broke the and, streak, and we won in overtime. Yeah. And Bugsy like jumped on the pile <laughs> and cut a guy's arm with a skate, no. and the guy was like almost dying. We're like. We can't even win right. Like we're such losers. Like we, we almost killed a guy in our winning celebration. That was so. Arizona. That was we had fired Bobby Francis, and Rick Bonus took over as interim coach. And Bones was like my guy. Like he was awesome, yeah, great guy to me. And he comes in after after the second period. I think the score was three three. And he comes in. and He goes, "Boosh, you're out." In a three three game, like weeks before, I was like the best. You know, I was stopping everything. And I looked at him and I go, "Why?" So I went to the trainer because I'd had a back issue. So I went to the trainer and thought he sewered me and was like, hey, get him yeah. out because he's hurt. So I asked him, I said, did you tell him? And he's like, no. Nope. So I went into Bones' office and I was like, what's the deal? And he pointed right at the goalie coach, Benny Allaire. And I was like, oh my God, my goalie coach. He sewered three, you. 3-3 three game. What? what? Wow. Yeah. And it, going into the it, third? It's a long, it's a long, yeah, going into, it's a long story. I was did they, did I the was game third. even mean anything? No, it, we were two terrible teams. It right. That's what but it was weird. a 3-3 three, three game. Like you never pull, no. a, like it's it's so rare to pull a goalie in a, in a it's tie like game. It's unheard of. Yeah. And this is not like we're battling for a playoff spot. But b before everything happened with, with the shutout streak, I was third string goalie for a month in Phoenix behind Sean Burke and Zach Burke. And I, I couldn't practice with the team. Like I had to practice just with the goalie coach, like like an hour and a half to two hours before practice. So I had to show up and then I had to leave. Like I was, they were treating me like team. I was like a black, e yeah. black ace. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, I had no idea what was going on. And I went into Bobby Francis's office after like a month and I said, hey, you know, do you think I can ever practice with you guys again? And he's like, what took you so long to come in here? It was a test. Yeah, I was like, I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm just following my orders. Yeah, like, I'm doing you know? what I'm told. And he he told me he's like he's like uh, the goalie coach thinks you need work alone, and he doesn't want you practicing with the team. So basically, the goalie coach, Benny, this goalie Lewis, coach, hated oh, your shots, oh my god, dude. Yeah. That's, he was well, trying that, to get you to quit. That's <laughs> Lundqvist's guy. 
Yeah. Ben Wallet. He's a great goalie. Do coach. you guys still have do you have a good relationship now? Did you guys hash it, it out or clean cleaned up? I've seen him since, but like we had a little bit of a run in there. Yeah, when I got pulled, I, I went I went wild there. You did? Yeah. Do you have I a bit of a that. quick wick with with that type of shit? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you had a bad temper. Um, yeah, have you ever fought shit. a teammate in practice? Yeah. I fought uh in the minors, Andy Delmore. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was my roommate. Uh, we lived together, and uh, he blocked the shot. He didn't want to block a shot in practice, and he fell down like a ton of bricks. And I was just laughing my ass off. So he got up, was all pissed, and he Poopy took pants. a swing at me. So I, I took a swing at him. <laughs> and I don't know many punches were landed. That was but in Philly. That was in Philly with the fans. Of all the yeah. guys you could have picked with the Philly players that they had, that was probably the best That's guy. The best guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wasn't going to be Frank Bialois, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Frank the animal. Frank <laughs> were, you, were you in a, a Goldberg sitcom in a, in a you TV know it. show? Yep. Well, how the fuck did that happen? <laughs> So Tockett told me he turned it down. That's what he said. <laughs> he said, that's how I got it. I said, bullshit. I said, they wanted the kid, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, I just got a call out of the blue. And uh, I was like, sure, I'll do it. It was like, in the, the schedule was light in January. So I went out there. I did it. They called me one take because I nailed the lines. <laughs> lines? Yeah. You had oh, multiple? Yeah, six, six, buddy. Holy shit. Nailed what show was it? Goldberg's. Don't act like you didn't hear about yeah. it. Yeah, come on. Goldberg's. I saw the clip. I, 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 right? I actually have a DVR. I truthfully, that was the, it's the last season. It, it was canceled after that, so that's why I say for Very you guys, is this your guys' last show? <laughs> oh, what? Um, oh, well, that, the jinx, a, I, the reverse <laughs> chicklets oh, yeah, bump. Yeah, oh, great. Hey, while we're talking about TV shows, our good friend Terry Ryan has Shorzy. You played with him in juniors. Oh you got to give what? us something. Oh, yeah. yeah, which is bizarre. Were you in Tri City, Bush? You're from Rhode Island. Yeah. Like, how did you end up in the Western League? So it was before, like, the geographic designations for U.S. kids. So uh, I was going to go – I wanted to go to college. I was playing Tier 2 my senior year in high school in Wexford, which was in Toronto. And uh, OHL teams are coming to look. They're like – because I was rated early second round. They're like, hey, you want to come to the OHL? I was like, yeah, sure, I'll take, take a look. So I wanted to go to BC, and BC wanted nothing to do with me. So PC and, and Michigan State were recruiting me. And I didn't get a scholarship offer yet. It was like kind of like early November, and I was rated second round. So I called Tri City, said, "Hey, would you guys release me so that I can go to the OHL?" And they said, "Just come check it out. If you don't like it, we, you know, it can only come for forty eight hours. We'll we'll release you." And uh, I went there as a game against Kamloops, and it was like they had won like four four Memorial Cups in a row. They had like yeah. Shane Doan, Iggy, Darcy Tucker, yeah, Iggy, yeah, all the boys. Like I mean, they were a wagon. Yeah, yeah. Tyson and Ash was yeah. there. Well, is he part of the wagon or? <laughs> I, think, I, I think he was a great. He was, he was a great. He, yeah, was, yeah. he was a great player. On he was that like team. a double overage. So yeah. I think he was really extending his time. Four in the yeah. dub. Just ask him about it. He loved that team. Oh, he uh, loves Kamloops. Yeah, the glory days. But uh, yeah, so I went and saw it, and I was like, oh my god, I'm playing here. It was great. And uh, Terry was on that team. He he was from Newfoundland, and he was he went to Quinell, BC to play tier two at like 14 years old. This kid's nuts. Yeah, I mean, he is nuts, bona fide nuts. I mean, the stuff that he would do. He once drove around Tri City. He's probably told you guys. These he stories. wrote a book. His book. He has yeah. all these Tri City stories in there. It's crazy. He, he, you know, those crash test dummies that used to be in the Volvo commercials. <laughs> so he put a crash test dunny, <laughs> dummy mask on, and he would drive around Tri City in a Dodge sa Dodge Shadow that he painted pink and gold and he'd cut people off and then you know they'd lay the horn on him then he'd look over at them and he'd <laughs> crash his dummy man he's still doing shit like that oh at chicken's cup and he's oh, 45 yeah. <laughs> he used to do like play by play of uh just different play -by like at night when we're sleeping at long bus rides it'd be like three in the morning and he'd get into this like play by play of you know the the 1983 memorial cup championship and he'd go and start going after our assistant coach this guy, Pat Lawyer, and, and saying, Lawyer's got the puck. <laughs> lawyer turns it over. <laughs> and they lose. You know, everything was about Lawyer being the He's fall guy the and blowing it <laughs> and letting everybody down. <laughs> so we would die, and he'd come and he'd like drum up these things in his head, these new, these new stories. And we just wait, We're like, what's the next one going to be? And oh. then finally, Lawyer came to the back of the bus and grabbed him by the throat. <laughs> oh, he had enough. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, climbing over the seats. He's like, you're, you're, you're fucking dead, Terry. You know, you're coming after him. And Terry's like, what, what? <laughs> you know, I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> it was oh. Boosh, it was Boosh. Yeah, as if he doesn't have the most, like, distinguished voice of I all know. time, too. Eh? Blame he, it on his father. He, well, so <laughs> was Sheldon Surrey still there at that he, time, too? So he, he got traded to uh, uh, Kelowna, I think it was. He was there at the start. Yeah, he was, was. He was he a killer then, dude? 
Oh. That, he's a complete weapon, by the way, that guy. He's a Bro- stallion. <laughs> and, he, and he broke my pants one, one game, played against him like a slapper. Yeah. Actually broke the shell on my pants. He could shoot it. He could fight. Yeah, he had I, it all. He, he could yeah. fuck. I won. <laughs> You'd see the trainer quite often for you know various injuries. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, groin pulls. How did you uh like as a Rhode Island kid? Like because you probably don't know our army. Like Mount St. Charles is. If you're from Rhode Island, like Brian Barrard is an amazing place. Oh, yeah. How did you not end up going to high school there? Two first no, overall no, picks yeah. from Rhode no, Island. No, I did. Oh, you did oh, go there. Did. Yeah, but you just you you were just kind Played of my my. I didn't I didn't make the the varsity team my freshman and sophomore year. What? Oh, so yeah. that's why you left? No, I played my junior year. Okay, and then I made the select seventeen team. This was before NTDP. You probably like yeah. Match, I, right? Same thing for me. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I got cut at select sixteens. First cut at Lake Placid, and Berard was driving back to me from Lake Placid. And he made he was like the best player in the world. So he's, he's all sick. excited, and you know, I'm looking out the window crying. You know, <laughs> he's like, "That was yeah. the best <laughs> camp, <laughs> huh, bro, <Bosch>, huh? <laughs> he was a good friend. He was like, he was, he, he, he was, he kept it low key. You know what I mean? But then my 17 year old year, I ended up making uh, the select 17 team after getting cut the first go round as 16, and that's when everything happened so fast. I think that's why colleges weren't quick to to recruit me because they just didn't know who I was. But when I was rated early second round, I just wanted to play hockey. Yeah, and I was like. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I wish I could go back in time and maybe, you know, after visiting my buddies at BC that, you know, like Brendan Buckley and Marty Reeser and those oh, guys. Oh, God. Like, it was unbelievable. Like, I played with see both those, of those guys. I, yeah, I go, I go see the, we go see those guys. I was like, oh, my God. This they is had amazing. a fun group. Motts was there. Oh, yeah. like, you still talk to Eats a lot? Yep. Mark Eaton? Yeah. We ran into him oh, at the great guy. Uh, Frozen Four. Yeah, we played with him in Pittsburgh. Where'd you see him? We ran into a Frozen Four in Tampa. He was oh, at our shit. hotel. I come around. I see his nose. <laughs> hey, no. How about desk. his pecs? His pecs are ripping. Yeah, he's he's still, still he same. still looks good. Still looks great. Yeah, I guess his was... daughter's like an unbelievable golfer. golfer yeah. Um, what? So, how? How? Do you, oh yeah, because he's from Rhode Island. No, no. he's he a Delaware a girl. Yeah, Delaware. he married a girl who's from Rhode Island. She moved to Delaware, and but her parents and all of her extended family are from Rhode Island. So he moved back there. This leads me to my, my next thing. I, I wanted to ask you, like, how did you know you were going to make it? I, I imagine. You just kept getting better and opportunities and everything. But going to the dub from where you're from and then you look at your career where you are, like you're naming like Reasoner, all these guys. Now all these guys are like GMs. Now there's yeah. guys that you played with that are coaching everywhere. Yeah. You like, you know, everyone in the league because you've done all this yeah. traveling, I guess. And just your career has afforded you, you I mean, that opportunity. You guys probably in the same boat. I mean, at that age, I didn't think about it. No, I, I wasn't just, either. I, I just, just wanted to play. I just did. You know what I mean, I just was like, mm-hmm. I'm not even going to overthink it. I think that's when I started to to get shitty was when I started to overthink it. I think when I just put the gear on and played and, you know, you were so excited. Like, you know, back then there was no overload of information. Mm-hmm. It was like you got the hockey news and you read it. It was a week yeah. late. I know. Yeah. Information, yeah. But you like looked at that guy. Like, the guy's <laughs> unbelievable. I want to be like him. And I just kind of, I just went with the flow. You know what I mean? And I, I was a good, I was a good junior goalie. Like I, I played really well in the Western League. I ended up being a first rounder. And I think once I got to pro, I kind of, you know, then then the pressure starts, I think, a little bit. You know, and in Philly, it's always about – the narrative is always, like, who's the next Bernie Perrant, you know? Yeah, yeah like, they haven't had a goal. I feel like yeah. they still have, like, yeah. with this new guy. It's got. the same thing. Same yeah. thing. It's never going to change until somebody wins. Wait, How did you start playing goalie? Like, did you play out or right away, we, at seven years old, you want to be a tender? So my older brother was a goalie, and uh, I was too young to play in the might team. So they asked my dad, they said, you know, what do you want to play goal? And I was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Because my, you know, I looked up to my older brother and I love the gear. I went in there. I gave up 11 goals my first game. We played, you know, those Mass State rinks? <laughs> yep. I don't even know which one it was, but they all look the same. MDC. Yeah. 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 And uh, we're, we're playing somewhere and I, I gave up 11 goals in half a game. They had another goalie playing like to try it. And my brother came down. He goes, ask the coach to go back in. <laughs> And I went up to the coach and said, can I go back? He goes, no, sit down. I have to give it up 11 and a half a game. So. <laughs> you were undefeated that you know, one year at Mount, weren't you? Oh, yeah. yeah oh, not, not a big deal. deal. <laughs> He's pretending he didn't they, know that they still have the, the chain link nope. fence as the glass? I remember playing no, with that. No, but it's the smallest rink you'll ever play in. Yeah. Jeez. No, they've got glass there now. Right. The I mean, our team was so good, though. I mean, we, we, you know, we had Brian Berard on our team. Like, if you would have seen this kid in high school. It was ridiculous, right? I mean... I mean, the players now are unbelievable. Like you watch these kids coming up; they're yeah. all they're all unbelievable skill. Can skate, can hit. He was everything in high school. Like he was the best I'd I'd ever seen for the longest time. 
He yeah. almost had to go to like the. Oh, he went, oh yeah, like he, he was too. Good. He was almost yeah, too. He good. played in yeah. Detroit, right? Yeah, Detroit. Was yeah. The, the, yeah, in the in the OHL. So like, as a kid, were you like training in the summer? Were you trying to get better every summer? Were you like, were you all in on hockey, or was it more like once the season's over, pads were off, and then you went and had fun, did other shit? No, I I didn't train at all. Like I, <laughs> you know, played baseball as a kid. Uh, you know, we had a great I had a great childhood. I mean, and I. It may sound like an if anybody's been to Woonsocket, you know, you'd probably be like, How can you have a great childhood there? But <laughs> believe it or not, like it was great. Like we had great athletes that came through there. Um, like Brian uh was neighbors with my 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 wife, you know what I mean? So like we knew each other as kids, so we played all the time, we played all different sports. That was like our training. You know, yeah. when I was a kid, that that's that's how we did it. And you know, it was like you guys probably we we just didn't focus on the way the kids are focusing mm -hmm. now like these kids are dialed in it's like yeah they're right away they're the dialed in too. played every sport yeah. played tennis whatever we get our hands on football mm -hmm. you know wiffle yeah. ball we did it all well you were probably like the same as me and i guess all of us like it was i remember eight in the morning summer you go outside you can come in for lunch and then be outside till it gets dark Yep. Like there was no like now like I live in a neighborhood. There's no kids outside anymore. Yeah, taking bizarre. Snapchats of their foreheads. <laughs> it's like my five head. Yeah. I don't get Hi. that. Yeah. They write on it. Hi. Yeah. Like why are you doing that? Like what are you? Did doing? you know while playing that because you're really good at what you do? You're unbelievable in oh, between yeah. the benches. Like it's it's really impressive. Did you know like hey I think I want to do something like that when I'm done or no idea? Uh yeah I think I had enough people like come up to me and say hey you know you should probably you know. Just oh, like yeah, you know, people saying it oh, to just you. Just people coming to this, hey, when you get done, you should probably, you know, look at doing this. And then you, enough people say it to you, and you're like, well, I what are you trying to send a message that I should probably, like, <laughs> retire, quit playing? Yeah. Like, Were you always I, like that, Bruce? That bad, you know? They told Were me all, that when I first got drafted. Your personality was always like that everywhere you went? I mean, like I all would, the guys on your team, like you're, you're kind of a you know, goalies are a little bit uh, strange, a little bit, but yeah, you're like kind the, of a normal goalie. Yeah. So. I, yeah I, I always thought I was normal for yeah. sure. I mean, I had, I had a fuse, like, I'd snap every once in a while. But for the most part, I was, you know, like team guy. I, I love the guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want. I love to be in the room. You know Laughing. what I mean? Yeah. And if I wasn't talking, I was nervous. Yeah. You know, so I felt like I had to talk, even when I played, um, just to kind of stay, to stay, you know, even keel. Yeah. But, when you were when you were drafted by Philly, were they still very very relevant? Like they, they weren't one of the big dogs in the NHL. They were awesome. Like we had like think about it. They had the Legion of Doom, mm -hmm. right? Like Big E was running over people. Johnny LeClaire was scoring 50 with his eyes closed. Those were your breaking years oh, in yeah. the NHL. My rookie year was unbelievable. Yeah. Like it was my rookie year was amazing. The guys that were on that team. So we had like Rick Tockett, uh, John LeClaire, uh, Eric Lynn J Dross, uh, Craig Berube, like uh, characters, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, uh, oh Luke Richardson. God. Renberg, uh, was he there? Rennie was there, but got traded. Uh, Roddy Brindamore was there. Then he got traded for Keith Primo, Eric Desjardins. Uh, Fuck, Philly was good yeah, for like twenty five years. We should have won the cup. In yeah. my, my rookie year, we should have won the cup. We who'd, three, who'd you lose to? It was that yeah. Jersey? Jersey. Remember the remember the game where Lindros got smoked by Steve? Yes, game seven, right? Yeah, that was my. And rookie that was year. his first game back too, wasn't it? Third. Oh, third. Okay. Uh, no, second. He played game six, so that was a thing. Like he probably should have been that playing was though. A, Right, he was. And you guys were fucking rolling, dude. We were winning with uh, with Peter White and Mark Gregg filling in for for Biggie, and I was like, I was just a dumb rookie, like I didn't know anything, and like a lot of the veterans were like, no, I, th you know, we're going, we're, we're going good right now. We're up three one in the series. We don't need to mess it up. And Biggie was ready to come back, and I think some guys were kind of like they didn't want it to happen. And then when he came in, we lost game five, or I don't know if he came in game five or game six, but he scored a goal in game six. And then game seven, he got smoked like five or six minutes in. Did that like what was that like silent. in your stomach? Like oh when you saw that? Because that was a that was a. I'll never forget watching that. He plowed yeah. through the middle, like he he came right down the gut, and it just like called bango. I got to be honest with you, I I thought that like, would sink your team. Hey, I, I thought like something bad. Yeah, it was like you know you don't. He wasn't moving. Like you thought he was dead. Yeah, like honestly, <laughs> that was like it actually crossed my mind. Like when he wasn't moving, the building was electric. Bef you know, because they, uh, uh, Lauren Hart who's our anthem singer, she mm -hmm. sang God Bless oh, yeah. America that was paired with like oh, Kate Smith. And they've yeah. done it a million times since, but that was the first time they did it. Oh, the, wow. when they put Kate Smith on the big what? app, like on the board. They shared they, the they song shared together. God Bless America. Yeah. And I mean, I got goosebumps just thinking about it. And and after that hit, place was silent. Silent. Now, did Beza get hurt that year? That That's how you filled in? Is that what? what no. Uh, 
it, it was, you know, Roger Nielsen was our head coach. He got sick, he got cancer. And then Craig Ramsey took over. And, you know, as we got like in the new year, they, they, they pulled us both in. They said, hey, we want to start playing you guys three games on, three games off, no matter what. And I was like, yeah, great for me. I was a rookie. Right. I think Beezer was like, what's going on here? And then <laughs> eventually the they, they turned to me, you know? I couldn't believe it. Every it was funny because like that year, like Jonesy was on that team. No, how funny was he back dude, then, dude? He's, he's the, the funniest person in the world. <laughs> you're gonna be you're gonna be on player. You're gonna be on one of his guys. Uh, yeah, you're gonna be <laughs> advisor. He does and all yeah. they do. He does. All they do is fuck around <laughs> together. <dude. laughs> that yeah, team yo. you just talked about. It's gonna be all that team just in the fucking <laughs> in the, in the, in the GM box. I'd sign up. Yeah, for yeah. That. yeah. Uh, Jonesy would always every time like I you know he knew I was like a nervous rookie sitting at the end of the bench. So would, every time Beezer would give up a goal, he'd. <laughs> skate down to the end of the bench and go start stretching kid and i'd be like <laughs> he's like oh, sit down you have going in <laughs> who would say that jonesy oh fuck <laughs> so so it's funny because now like we talked a lot this season that i think the future of goaltending is going to be combos and we talked about maybe even in the playoffs like the bruins went through it all year and then didn't do it and you were doing it then yeah so your opinion on like nowadays in terms of like do you agree Guys can't play 60 games anymore. Like, would you would you see the future of honestly being like 50, 30 games, 45, 40? I do. I, I just think because like the scoring chances now are outrageous. Like the skill is like go back and watch a game just from 2012. Oh, it's brutal. They're, they're it's so bad. Hockey. Huh? I watched some of my it's games. Crazy. I put on a game for my it's son disgusting. and I was We're like, so this slow. is the worst hockey I've ever oh, seen. Hey, no wonder you needed the fighting. That's that's yeah. where the entertainment yeah. was. Yeah. <laughs> that's where that's what it was. Yeah. It was the goaltending. Two one games too busy. You need the big save. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We provided that back. You need the shutout streaks. But like you said, the scoring chances were like two to one because guys could fucking hook all each up down the ice. Yeah, yeah. Now I mean, these guys going to games and it's. Like they do eight splits by the end of the second period. You know yeah, what I mean? Post to post, it's like unreal. That. It's unreal. So and so you think of the pressure, and I know everybody talks about parity, but if you looked at the standings this year, I think like the bottom, I don't know, maybe the bottom ten teams, they they were all pretty bad. Yeah, you know, weren't they? I mean, so the parity wasn't there this year, like it has been touted mm -hmm. in the past. But still, I mean, you know, you take a night off and guys get scoring chances, and I think it's hard for these guys to just mentally. You know, as much as you are in great shape physically and you think you can do it, it's it's the mental part for a goalie that I think is difficult. You look at the schedule and see, oh, geez, I got to play 60, 65 games. Like, that's that's mm -hmm. daunting. Yeah. I, I could never do it. Like, I could play for a stretch of games, put me in to start the playoffs, I'm good. You tell me to play eight out of nine in October, no chance. Like, Brodeur, Brodeur. That's why. The amount of games Brodeur sick. was paying. Those guys were sick. Like Vasilevsky now, like, he. he yeah. Who's, but, your, guy, who's yeah. your guy right now if you have to win one game? Who you pick? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of a yeah. no-brainer, right? I know this year it didn't, you know, they didn't get it done. But, I mean, the guy size and, and just skill and agility and flexibility, his power in his legs. I, he, for me, he's the best. I don't know if you mentioned this. Who's your guy growing up? Patrick you, Waugh. Waugh, yeah. Oh, fine. wow. You know anything about him? Like, do you know him personally? No. I love Patrick Watt, too. I, I don't, but when I got into this side of it and I was working for NBC and, you know, you're inside the glass and, and you got to go interview him, like, I was, like, I was in awe. Like, he was, like, my guy. Like, He's I, an intimidating guy. Yeah, he is. But I was, like, I had posters of this guy yeah. all over my room, you know? Like um, I was a player and I, I was a Habs fan. I used to draw Patrick Waugh. Like he was like the coolest, <laughs> right? Like, like, like art? being a goalie. Yeah, he had the cat art? eyes. He was like the oh, first yeah, goalie. Oh yeah, he used to draw like the way he I copied. I his... copied his, his his Canadians mask when yep. I was playing at Mount St. Charles. I copied it. Oh yeah, yeah. he was the man. He was the man. We were army. I gotta too. see some of these drawings. I got him. I used, I I found an old one that I drew of him. With my, <laughs> oh. kid. my mom has it, and I'll, right next to him. Pierre Turgeon in an Islanders jersey. I don't know why I like the French players. Yeah. Yeah. Was it Pfizer, after, was Pfizer it on too. Like, was it after the Dale Hunter hit? No. Yeah. <laughs> we were I mean, talking about that like, last night. Yeah. His arm in a sling. <laughs> He's in a He's body like cast. <laughs> Just getting wheeled out. Congrats to Pierre Turgeon on the Hall of Fame too, by the way. Oh. Were you a Habs fan too, Bush? Oh. Wow. Like Me too. The for the Rhode Habs. Island kid. Yeah, I was a huge Habs fan. Wow. So my mom and dad are from a town called Magog, which is just outside of Montreal, like oh, near Sherbrooke. Okay. So, um, you speak I, French only when I drink, <laughs> <laughs> but I he's don't like, understand a lick. He's so. like, a, he's like done more in cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Pass me the Jean Louis. <laughs> oh, yeah. Shit. My parents spoke French around me, but they didn't speak French to me. Like by the time they got, to, I had an older brother that they spoke French to and he really struggled in school. So I think they thought they screwed him up. 
Turns out he probably That's what happened to me. I went 50-50. I switched from... Now you don't speak either. either, I'm 50 (laughs) Hey, now we don't know it. His brother's PJ Stock. (laughs) 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 What do they call that? uh, Frang- Franglish, oh. Francophone, Francophone, Franglish, because he speaks uh, like French English. Because he's, like, yeah. yeah, he's like broken. Oh, in both, stock, a yeah, stock. Yeah, that's awesome. That's hilarious. Yeah, so, so I was a Canadians fan growing up. Okay, yeah, in, oh, Bruin, in Bruins you. country. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from my friends at BetterHelp. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, gang, you ever have one of those spots in life you just don't know what to do going forward? You might be stuck in the mud don't know how to get out of it. We've all been there. I know when I got out of college a little later than usual, I didn't know what to do. I was trying to find my path and it took me a while to get there because sometimes in life we're faced with tough choices and the path forward isn't always clear. Uh, I certainly had a few of these spots in my life, definitely not just getting out of college. And I really wish there was something like better help back in the day. I certainly could have used it back then. Fortunately, we have it now because whether you're dealing with decisions around career, relationships, anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while you navigate life. So you can move forward with confidence and excitement. I know it's not always easy for everybody, but something like BetterHelp can help you immensely because trusting yourself to make decisions that allow your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. Can't recommend it enough because it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched to a licensed therapist. And switch therapist anytime at no additional charge. Sometimes, you know, the pairing might not be great for you, whatever. No problem. Do your old switch roof or nothing. They'll take care of you at BetterHelp because you need to find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash chicklets today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash chicklets. Yeah. W- yeah. Was, it a, was it a trade situation that brought you to Phoenix? Like what ended up, how, how did you end up getting there? Yeah, so I had a I had a slip up there uh, in the post media scrum there at the end of my third year. No, stupid. You what? said something stupid which set the organization off to get rid of you. Oh yeah, well I mean maybe it was coincidence, <laughs> but I think it did. What'd you say? I gotta hear this. I um so they asked me uh, in the you know we lost to Ottawa in five or something like that, and I I played game five because Checkmanic pulled himself from the. He would do. He was this a all bizarro, time. huh? He'd do this all the time. He he'd say he's, he'd tell me Brian beat Eddie, and I'd be like, "What?" You know, and <laughs> that then was out, out last night. And then yeah, and then he'd go out and get a shutout, and I was like, "Dude, shut up!" You know what I mean? Like, don't don't mess with me like that. But oh, yeah. in the playoffs, he was like done. Like some games, he just he skated the center ice in Game Four in Ottawa. He's like waving at me at the bench to come on. Like I make the call. Like I'm the one that pulls the goalie. You know. And Adam Oates, who was like new on our team, he looked over. He's like, "What the hell is going on here?" <laughs> I was like, well, "I don't know," you know. And uh, so, game five, they played me, and we lost in overtime. So I don't know. Then they spoke to me in the you know when the season's over, you know, when, you know, when they clear out the so lockers. So what you felt? Did you feel like that put you in a bad spot? No, I wanted no. to play. Like yeah. I, to be honest with you, I was mad that I didn't even get to start. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and you know, Bill Barber was was the coach. I had him in the minors, and. You know, I just they, Checkmatic was great for the two years that he came in. He came out of nowhere, and he ended up getting like rookie of the year and uh, played in the All Star game his first year after my rookie year. Um, and I just was, you know, so they in, 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 when they're clearing out the lockers, you know, they ask you to say, "Hey, did Bill Barber lose lose the hockey team?" Oh no! And you know, I might have been hung over. I don't know. You know, you <laughs> yeah. know how it is, right? Yeah. And I said, uh, "Yeah." No way. No yeah. shit. Come on. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Zach Hill, Zach Hill, like the PR guy, he's like, I see him like behind the media crowd. He's like, he's like, and I go, I was like, oh, you know what I mean? I, I was like, I want to immediately take that back. Right. And they're like, well, well, how, you know, and I don't know what I said after that. And I just, and then I will say this, Keith Primo, who was our, who was our captain, I believe he was our captain. Yeah. He, uh, he backed me up. After like when the media asked him, he kind of like instead of like leaving me out on an island, he he backed me up. And, you know, I look back on it. It was it was a great learning moment for me, like that. Sometimes you don't say what you actually feel. You know, you have to kind of you have to kind of hide some things. And I I was emotional and um, I wish I never did it because honestly, uh, Billy Barber is a guy that's a a Hall of Famer, a flyer legend, you know, like he's he's mm-hmm. revered in that city and the fans weren't gonna like that no matter I what. I shouldn't have done it. Yeah. It was stupid of me. I just was some 
pigeon backup goalie that should have never been speaking like that. I was out, I was out of line. And uh, so right away I, I went up to Bob Clark's office and um, I said to him, I said, I, I made a huge mistake, Clark. Yeah, I said, I, 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 you know, I said. Before like, it had even been printed or, or put yeah, out yeah, there? Yeah, right away. Like okay. the, after, because Zach pulled me aside. He's like, Boosh, he's like, you just gave major. There's a shit storm now. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, like. <laughs> Immediately, the heat came over me, and like, I've been know, sleep maybe yet. you know what? Maybe there had I also been like earlier. you probably don't know there maybe been articles already written in the paper, like you know the, maybe they were trending a few. There's no doubt there was some writers that were you know kind of on to that our team was underachieving. Yeah, right? so so that was already in the yeah, water. Yeah, this was not something that yeah. was like out of the blue, but still, it's not for a third year player yeah. to say. And and I went up to Clarky's office and I told him what I said and he goes well he goes I'm glad you said it not me <laughs> <laughs> and he traded me about three weeks later well Bush is done yeah <laughs> did you well, ever talk to Barber well this makes it easy yeah I've talked I, I talked I've talked to him since yeah and, um, like I said I, I I I have so much respect for Billy like we won a Calder Cup together in the minors and. Um, I just was emotional, you know what I mean. Yep. And when you're when you're emotional, mm -hmm. sometimes you you do stupid things, you know. So uh, going yeah. back to Czech Monarch, w w was he just like a, a crazy mental midget? And as far as the goaltending aspect, like you've heard of guys like sometimes like coming, they're supposed to get the start, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I can't go tonight. And then now the backup who didn't know he was going to start, didn't have the same pregame routine, gets thrown in the mix. Yeah, he did it to me one time. Yeah, he he like if he didn't want to play, you knew it. We're, it was an afternoon game on a, on a Sunday in in MSG, so it's three o'clock. So what do you think? You know, there's no morning skate. Yeah, I can have oh. a couple tonight. Yeah, Saturday night had a couple, right? And uh, he told me in the locker room, "Be ready," and I was like, <laughs> and he'd done this like ten times to me, and nothing ever happened. So again, I was like, "Well, shut up, dude." He goes out there, gives up a goal, right? He skate after the goal. He skates after the referee to the timekeeper's box. So they tee him up and they give him a minor for I don't know what he's doing. I'm watching this in the old MSG. There's like the glass and you sit there and I'm like, yeah, yeah. this is interesting. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he gets back to the crease. Now they got a power play, ensuing power play. He two hands a guy in front of the net. <laughs> Penalty five on three. Oh, I'm fuck. like, what is going on? This guy's like unhinged right now. Yeah. His eyebrows just twitching. <laughs> During the five on three, he mysteriously drops to his belly out. He's on his belly. And I'm sitting there going, get up, get up. <laughs> buddy, get up. <laughs> he warned me. And sure enough, he leaves the game with a so-called ankle injury. And uh, I, go torn in, I go in on the five on three, get torched. We lost like six nothing or something like that. Lindros was playing for the Rangers at that time. I think he scored a hat trick and they play that stupid Rangers song. Hey, there, you know? hey, <laughs> oh, hey, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey. I, I just wanted to kill him when I got in the locker room. I was like, where is he? I want to, you know, because yeah. he told me, he warned me, but I just wasn't ready for it, you know? It's kind of a weird dynamic, like I'm guessing with with two goalies right like i'm sure you had relationships where you're pretty competitive and not very friendly and then there was probably times when you were real close with the other guy right yep yep early on in my career i had a like with beezer my first partner like i was so thrilled to be in the nhl like i was like i was, it was an american icon like it was great to be with him you know what i mean like i was so great. looking up to him yeah yeah exactly and then after that i started to get this like chip on my shoulder where i felt like it had to be my net you know so i went through a phase where i had to have this attitude like you know I'm not going to get buddy buddy with the goalie. With the guy. Now the guy that I played with in the minors, Neil Little, no, he's, he's a, a legend. He's a I beauty. I heard that guy's an all timer. RPI, RPI, RPI guy, guy, legend. Is he a legend? Why are you making that face, Bush? Is he a legend? legend. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> a lot we, of. Great we saw him in Vegas, him. right? Was the, that him? We the saw the wheels him in Vegas? are spinning. Oh, that was Rob, oh, Robert, that was Robert, Robert I think we got the 30 minutes goalie. of the next uh, next 30 Neil, minutes. Neil Little, who we need on this podcast. Neil Little, he's out of his mind. Litz is a great guy. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Why? What, what, what do you mean? There's not more? Give us one. Listen, I, I, you know, you got to get permission, you know, exactly. to share. But uh, he, he was a great partner, my first partner in the minors. And if I had a bad game, he'd be the first one there to, to pick me up and say, hey, you know, you got to start drinking a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. But he was, he's just, you're right, he's an all timer. This guy's an all timer. And so I had a great experience with him. And then he went, they loaned him out to the IHL my second year in the minors. And I had this guy, Jean Marc Pelletier. So it was a real competition between he and I because we were both draft picks. And that's when I started to like 
you know, I get like that. But then towards the end of my career, when I knew I wasn't going to like it was over for me, like I just wanted to be a great teammate and a good partner to mm. some of my, you know, like of getting to Bokov, um, uh, was a guy that I, you know, really wanted to be a good partner. Nick, Nick have I was in Chicago for a little bit. Um, you know, those are guys that you just, you know that they're better than Mika Kiprasov. I was in Calgary for a cup of coffee. Oh shit. Yeah. He used to rip darts with the fans, wouldn't he? He was, <laughs> I think he would, he'd go in the steamer after every game. And I think he'd crush a six pack and, you know. <laughs> Fins no, are up. Oh, there's, there's something else. And this he guy, played in Timur in the lockout year. And when the season ended, he used to sleep in the bar. He spent a whole week and all he did was sleep in the bar of the tables. <laughs> Kiprasov, legend. A, yeah. Another this goalie guy, legend. This guy was so good. And he wouldn't even sweat. He'd just sit in his stall. You wouldn't even know he's live. He'd look like a homeless guy, like sitting there in the room, he had top shelf, you know. Wait yeah. till the seven minute mark. He gets up, puts his gear on, he goes out there, and then he makes like 47 saves. And he doesn't sweat. Like, never seen anything like it. And he looked like he had, didn't have a care in the world. Yeah. But un, unreal talent, that guy. I wanted to ask you, like a lot of young listeners, like goalies, like what's one piece of advice like, as a starter, a backup? Like, what can you give advice to young goalies out there? Quit. Uh, what's that? Quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't <laughs> Change play, position. Don't play in that. You know what? I, I think you got to have uh, a, an attitude, you know, kind of that. Maybe I took it a little too far, like when I was, you know, at the start of my career. You have to have an attitude, though, that there's one net, Yeah. in my opinion. Like, I see too many goalies now. If you just watch and, and, and you see them, like, they kind of don't want to play. You know, mm -hmm. like they kind of, they look like, like they there's some play. fear. There's some fear. Yeah. They're like, nah, you know, I'll, I, you know, all of a sudden they get this like this injury that just pops up out of nowhere. And you're like, you know, I, we can't even count on this guy. Like if you want to be a, a real great yeah. goalie, like you got to, there's only one net. And I think you got to have this mindset that you're the guy and nobody's going to take that net from you. Cause if, you know, if you're, if you're okay with watching another guy succeed, uh, you're not going to be the guy. You're not going to be the guy that makes the money. Well, that's every day. That's every, every day. day. Yeah. Every day you got to work, you know, and you got to have that killer instinct. I think if you lose that edge to you, then you got to transition and pivot. Like, I think I had to pivot later on in my career and be like, okay, clearly I'm not that good and mm -hmm. I need to survive in this league. And we all kind of find a role where yeah. we got to be good team guys and, yeah. and find a way to be a good guy that can play once every five, six games, yeah. which is not easy either. No. A lot of starters can't do that. It feels it feels like there's a lot of adapting from a teammate perspective, like you just said, right? Where you're you, you have to have the mind frame of wanting to be the starter, but then when you're not, you got to be a supportive teammate. So it's hard to really find that balance, and because yeah. you're come, rooting, and get, you're yeah, like go in, go in, but then you're like, well, um, why well, well, I, well, I don't know if I would be saying that, but I mean, dude, probably the guys no, are for sure. He, in their he's head. right. He's right. You're like go go in, hundred percent. I was. I wanted guys to get pulled. I wanted to play. Hundred yeah. percent. Show you know, you're not going to say it opens, I'll show you a loser, you know? Yeah. Like, I wanted to be in there. But then I realized at a certain point, I, I, I you know, this, this is not working, you know? And I'm not going to be a starter. So you, you got to adapt, be a good teammate. Yeah. So, like, if guys are, in, you know, struggling, you know, you go talk to them and try and help them out and, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, remind them that they're a great player and try to pick them up. And I always found that when I was a backup, guys played, played hard for me. Like, I mean, they guys really – Played hard for me, and I I always appreciated that. And maybe it was, I think for the most part, because as I transitioned to a backup, I tried to be as good a guy as possible. I, I would imagine when you went to Phoenix, you saw that in Sean Burke a little bit because he seemed like the type of guy where he wanted the net. Oh yeah, he was, oh, he's he intense. Was, eh? He's pretty intense, right? Oh yeah. And obviously, he's transferred that over into being an excellent coach. He uh, yeah. I mean, I think when I got there, I think he was kind of like you know like what is this guy doing here? Like why do we trade for this guy? Because you're a first rounder, <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, what's going on? And he had a great relationship. I got traded for for Robert Ash, and mm -hmm. he was good buddies with him. And and I think Chico at that time was kind of like the understudy, wasn't really you know forcing the envelope, you know, he wasn't with, threatening with, or, to him. Yeah, exactly. And then I came in, and and I think that was you know it kind of changed the dynamic a little bit. So you know you had to get Berkey's trust. I like Berkey. I mean, he was he was a competitor. Like oh, once yeah. a year, he would he'd f you the whole room. Oh, Oh, yeah. The whole room. Oh, yeah. Grab really? a stick. Oh, yeah. And he'd bury everybody. Even me. Yeah, half He'd baked. bury me. Half big. <laughs> You're like, I'm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Fuck he, you. Fuck you. Yep. Fuck you. You're cool. Fuck you. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. And he would tell guys, like, some guys are shooting high. He's like, you shoot you shoot over my knees at practice and we're fighting. You know, and he's like, huge. Oh, too, he was like, jacked. Yeah, yeah, he was jacked. I was like, and he'd yell at me and I, oh, my God. 
So I kind of knew not to bark up that tree what, too loud. What has, like, in your mind, what has led to him legit being a goal, goalie whisperer? Like Devin Dubnik, Mike Smith. Like mm -hmm. it goes, it, it, he's, he's like changing guys' careers. Like could you have seen that when you played with him that that would be his future? Well, his I think he takes a lot of the principles that Benoit Allaire uh, took. Your like, boy. Yeah. Well, the thing, and the, re the reason why it didn't work for me was because I was an aggressive goalie. Like I like to, you know, challenge a little bit more. Um, and Benny was about playing deep. Like he oh, wanted okay. you to play yeah. in, in like, like look at exactly yeah play in the blue paint and the idea was you know you beat the pass instead of moving four feet now your lateral movement is two mm -hmm. feet and you're there you're there ahead of time and uh, you know you can make but I was getting beat with like wristers from the top of the circle you know that are going off the post and I'm like looking around I'm like well I'm in the blue paint like why didn't yeah. I stop that you know and eventually you know it's a result business and if you don't make saves they go to the next guy and that's what happened yeah. I think he just kind of he he'd seen that I was. Not, it wasn't catching on wasn't for you. Catching on. And that's yeah. why I think good goalie coaches are the ones that can work with different guys. Yeah. I know you have principles and ideas, but look at Berkey's goalies. Like you said, Mike Smith. Um, all big guys. All big Brzezgalov, guys. Brzezgalov. He yeah. had uh, Devin Dubnik. Dubnik. Um, Get him yeah. deep. Is he in Vegas now? Aiden he's Hill. In Vegas. Yeah, Aiden, Aiden, Aiden Hill. Hill's a Aiden perfect Hill's just example. a blob. Just yeah. Big yeah. So he's almost, line. he's working with what the player has as opposed to just you have to do this, this yeah. way. Well, I, I think he's probably got to work with it. Like, he, you know, he had Jonathan Quick there this year, and, and Quickie never got in a playoff game. Why? I mean, because Quickie plays two feet outside the blue paint. <laughs> I think he's fun to watch. Quickie slide around his knees all over the place. Like. And I just think it creates drama. You know, like if you're a D-man and yeah. you're turning around, Chaos. your goalie's in the corner. Yeah. And now you got to haul a guy down when you thought it was just a routine play. Yep. You know, I, I don't think it fit their system. And I think – so for Berkey, I'm sure he's working with Quickie, but he respected him enough for what he accomplished, you know – to be able to, I think to Quickie. I mean, we keep talking about. I feel like he'd adapted that role of being a great supporter yep. and a great, uh, yep. a great sounding. I hope he keeps him. playing too, man, because he he has to go down as the best American goalie ever. Yeah, yep. I think he's 16, 16 wins away from tying Ryan Miller. Like I like to see him get to four hundred. And the guys like him too, like Flurry, Quickie, like these guys. Those are the goalies you like pay to go watch yeah, yeah it is entertaining we talk about yeah. chaos but like yeah. they go post to post or they're sliding on their knees like a maniac yeah. like yeah. quickie they're just different you know there's yeah. not there's not enough of those guys I mean, a yeah. lot of the guys are big blockers they keep it in front of them it just hits them now they're technically sound it's like yeah. they all look the same you close your eyes and put a different jersey on them you think it's the same guy that you just watch from yeah. another team but you're right like you know quickie flurry vasilevsky's a little bit different mm -hmm. because he's a little more dynamic but for the most part a lot of them are the same guy Mm -hmm. And it's effective. I mean, but I used to like a good poke check and a two pad stack every <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. once in a while. At, you know, at, at, I mean, I know you don't, you didn't want to. I'm assuming, but at what point did you kind of realize, oh, I'm probably going to be a career backup, and and then obviously you start bouncing around a lot, right? Was that was that kind of a shitty situation? The yeah. fact that you had to go place to place to place. Yeah, it was after the first lockout, and that that killed my career. Um, I went to Sweden after I think it was '04. I remember because the Sox had won the the World Series mm -hmm. and it was after they won and I signed to go to Sweden and I went there and then we thought the lockout was going to end at Christmas time like we got rumblings that you know we're going to play after Christmas we're going to do a 24 percent rollback so a bunch of us that were playing in Sweden pulled the plug and said okay we'll go home for Christmas and then head to our NHL cities which for me would be Phoenix and we'll go skate and get ready and we get there and we're skating in, in Phoenix and I'll never forget we go to the lobby to watch the press conference and Gary Bettman cancels the season. Oh, or like, I wouldn't have left Sweden. <laughs> right. Now you can't go back to Sweden. You just gave up your job. So we turn those ice sessions into tea times after yeah. that. <laughs> but, you know, you don't play from January on. And those are important reps that you don't get at, a, at an important age. And, and after that, I just, it was just chasing my tail for the next three years until I decided I want to go back to the minors in order to get my game back. And Philadelphia signed me to a minor league deal to play and I played 42 games and finally got my confidence back because everywhere I went I was like playing 10 12 13 games a year and I stunk I just mm -hmm. stunk I couldn't you know couldn't keep it together how quick can the confidence go is it just like one goal one game one shift like yeah, I was gonna ask about that as a goalie like I think it's different for everybody I mean okay. I, I probably wasn't as mentally tough as you know I needed to be you know and you uh it, it went pretty quick on me but I think that lockout it just you come back and the game changed, all these new rule changes. Faster. Not, faster, no red line, uh, shootouts, uh, 
penalties galore. I think no, there were like 15 power thing. plays. Well, well and and how about the pads and all? You, oh, they had to, everything was a yeah. Small. They like, started they really, they really the pads, kind yeah. of fucked the goalies to try to create more scoring. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Boo -hoo, boo -hoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, now and now and now the goalies have you know figured out. Although I think the forwards in the last like three years have kind of I think they've kind of figured out how to beat these guys. Like if you look at save percentages, they're they're down now. Yeah, there's not. A, I Goals don't, are up. I feel like there's not the elite goalies that we had probably when we were growing up, right? Like Cujo and Eddie Belfour and Hashik and Wah and Brodeur. You know, this is kind of like who? I mean, I feel like you got Vasilevsky, Shesterkin, Sorokin. Nice. Well, do you, I know. I, uh, Hank was talking about on the broadcast how a lot of them adapt this like V eight VH system. Yeah. Is vertical or yeah. horizontal? So they just kind of get in position. It's like, oh, well, if they score there, they score there. Where there's a lot percentages, less, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there may be a lot less like creativity in that as far as like making sure you just kind of stand up and, and, and stay on your feet. Yeah, I think sometimes you know the, the you know you, you got to read the play. I mean, it's great to have that tool in your toolbox. You don't have to use it every single time. Mm -hmm. I think these guys just right away go to the reverse VH. Anytime the puck gets below the dots, they just right away they go right to the post. And players have figured it out. Like they just rip it right by their ear. Yeah, they're going right? short side. And what used to be like, oh, line. yeah, it used to be like, oh my God, it's an unbelievable goal. I mean, it's still a great goal, but I mean, it's not as rare as it, yeah. you know, as because guys have the shooters have figured it out, which is, you know, kudos to them. Was the butterfly already dominant when you went pro, or, or did it kind of it kind of evolve basically over several years? You like, know, it, after Watt came, it evolved more after my time. I think Patrick was the first one, really. I think to do it the most. Um, but now I think guys are playing from their knees. Like they've learned to, you know, use their inside edges and push from their knees. Whereas before we'd go on a butterfly and then we'd get up with do the two knee jump up thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah like uh, <laughs> Keanu Reeves and, and uh, John Wick and Young Blood. Oh, yeah. Young Blood. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. John Wick. <laughs> Headshots. Isn't he in John Wick? Yeah, he's, oh. he is John Wick. He's yeah. talking about fucking Matrix. Yeah. Whoa, no, the Matrix. Yeah. He's talking Six, about Matrix. Like, <laughs> You're actually a good guy to ask. I have this theory. I've, 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 I've talked about it before. I want to get a guy, he's six, seven, six, eight, and he just stays in the butterfly the whole game. Just stay down and just, you know, like that puck's never going five hole because he's already down there. And, you're like, the Islanders, you're like the old Islanders so. GM that no. wanted to get a sumo wrestler. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. He's like, I'm just going to get a sumo wrestler as a goal. Like, how many goals you see? He's looking around, and then it goes five hole on him. So you're just always down. Maybe in Vegas' system with the way that they keep it to the outside yeah. And, yeah. and the rebounds are cleared out. But once there's a cross-ice pass, how do you move? Yeah. There's still, I mean. Morales wants a guy who doesn't even have to move. Six, the net is six <laughs> feet, isn't it? Isn't it six yeah. feet wide? Six by four. And yeah. now everyone is like, analytically, statistically, it's like that Royal Road Pass. It's like. They've got the numbers on it. It's like twenty five percent increase on your scoring chance. Yeah. Like a grade A is not a grade A anymore. Well, that's why, like, even on the power play, when it's like up at the top and it just goes from the top to a flank, like yeah. it's really not a hard save for a goal. It's when it goes top flank flank flank. Yeah, through your fuck. Now we're in trouble. <laughs> what, 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 what was your? I guess it changes for every guy. But like, say your team's dominating in the offensive zone. Like, what are you thinking about back there? Are you thinking about the game? Or are you just like mind wandering? <laughs> yeah, because we had Zach Whitecloud the other day. Yeah. We ran into him, and me and Merles are at Game Four in Florida, and he's like. Hey, man, I saw you and Merle sitting down there third row from the glass. I didn't want to wave at you because I was in the Stanley Cup final. Uh, yeah, I, I would definitely lose focus. But yeah, it's like a goal, it's a I'd be staring at like... broads in the crowd. I'd be like, oh, here we go. Wow. Here we go. Biz, you're up. We're, we're out there five on four. What the fuck are you doing? I think every guy's like that, though, aren't they? I mean, it's amazing how hyper aware you are of all your surroundings in an oh, NHL yeah. game, huh? Oh, yeah. Even, even the biggest of Stanley Cup finals. Everybody will be able to locate... Yeah, it's true. talent anywhere. Uh, <laughs> well said, Boosh. Very well articulated. Well, we're all talent That's evaluators. Why he's the best the um, <laughs> yeah, of all those like quick stops, like where was the funnest? I know you were in Chicago. You said you went to Calgary. Where else were you in the? Oh God, I was everywhere. Uh, Columbus, right? At Columbus, yeah. Um, Philly, Philly was the best. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, but you were there the longest. But of the short, all oh, the short ones. Yeah, um, probably San Jose. We should have won. Like we won a President's Trophy there. We should have won. I was there for a year and a bit. What year was that? Yeah, those uh, were the years where they just could never get it done, eh? Oh, they would always just run. Oh, we beat them at oh, in seven, Anaheim. Yeah, we were the eighth seed, and they, they were President Trophy. Was that that year? Oh nine. Yeah, yeah. We you had and, Jonas, and you guys, you had Jonas guys, Hiller in goal. Yes. He oh, was, dude, he was unbelievable. Yeah, you were there. Twenty six. Getzlaff and, Getz and Thornton Bush. fought each other. Bush, you had a nine nine Who seventeen did? save. Remember Getzlaff and Thornton fought? Yeah. In game five. Yeah. 
So leading into that playoff series, Hiller, Ron, you, right? Ron Wilson, yeah, Ron Wilson was the the head coach, right? And I'd come from the Philadelphia Phantoms because I had signed at the trade deadline uh, with the, with the Sharks for the rest of the year. And I get there, and he tells me when we before we start playoffs, he goes, "I need you to practice with the the other set of gloves because we got to get used to Jonas Hiller." I'm like, what? What? Yeah. He made you catch switchy. He made me catch this way. Oh, I had the stick in the face. wrong hand. And you really adapted. Like, buddy, I got <laughs> I got lit up so bad. Like, you know, Jumbo is like coming and he's like, ah, <laughs> chain up slappers at my glove. And I, you know, I'm, I want to turn it over because yeah. it's my blocker hand. I'm like, I think I'm going to break my hand. And yeah. they, they lit me up. But I'll tell you what, they realized that that didn't work because Jonas Hiller was a lot better right-handed goalie than I was, <laughs> and he stoned us. And then Ron Wilson Was that the, the biggest pigeon moment of your career? When yep, the that is a pigeon moment. That's such a pigeon moment. You talk about taking a bullet, you know? They're like, hey, Whit, uh, we're going to need you to throw the stripes on because we got a referee we don't really like. So I'm like, uh, I'm on the power play. <laughs> yeah, that was a... That was a real defining moment in my life right there. I didn't help the team. We lost first round. I gave up too many goals, so it gave them false confidence, I think. Exactly. They thought it was going to be easy. Uh, Well, you just mentioned Joe. Fuck, that must have been such a ball to play with him. What a guy. Oh, my goodness. Top, Everybody always top talks three. about him. He's, I guess he's still going around the room and showering with the boys, <laughs> even though that he's retired, skating with them. That's sometimes. his thing. He he loves the boys, huh? Yeah. Everything's shower with the boys. <laughs> hey, bud. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he – why is he, he just screams I don't know. Like he just oh, – he's always like, hey, bud. And he, like, he, you know, he walks around Joe with Thor his shirt, shirt off all the yeah. time. Uh he, I, and now he made our PR guy, Tom Holy, uh, who now is an assistant GM of San Jose. And I don't know if I should be sharing the story, but he'd make him do push ups before the game in the locker room. Like, this is our PR guy. <laughs> and Jumbo would be like, Give the boys, give the boys ten push ups here, holy, eh, bud? You know? <laughs> and he's in his suit, and the boys would be all standing up and just rallying around, holy, you know. It's all about the morale. Uh, right? And then he, you know, and he just he 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 loved the locker room. He loved the boys. He was a great teammate. It's a shame that he never won because oh, I, it, is, I, it is one guy I wish. Got he's just one. such a lovable guy. He just deserved it. Looking back, he player should have too, a cup. But. Yeah. And yeah, that year we lost to Anaheim. And then the next year we won the president's trophy and we beat Calgary first round, but we should have beat him easier and we didn't. And then we lost to Dallas in six. We should have won a cup that year. Like we had just an amazing team. Boyle, amazing guys. Was Boyle, there? Boyle was on that team. Was Murray, Douglas Murray. Crankshaft. Crankshaft. Oh, that, guy. Shit. that guy. People don't even understand about this guy. Like that. He's a machine. He's a Viking. A straight yeah. up yeah. Viking. I've heard stories from Billy. Cornell, yeah. San Jose, just a cigarette machine oh, yeah. and drinks. I, I watched him throw a keg in Cornell. He took a keg, empty keg, one hand like this, and just flicked it and went all the way across the street. <laughs> I, like, it was the most... It was like a movie. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen to this day. Just whoop, like that. Um, were you always uh, chumming it up with the media guys? I felt that I was always engaging with them, even when the cameras weren't rolling, like yeah. shooting the shit. Is that kind of maybe what made you a little bit more comfortable as far as starting to ease into it? Yeah, in Philly, because... Because like you know, they were pretty tough there. We had this one guy, Tim Panaccio, who's always he's still there, right? No, he's always retired tired. now. Yeah, he, he would always he was always going after like Clarky for the Lindros stuff, and he was always stirring the pot. So I'd always come in the room after practice, and I go, "Hey, Panach, what are you stirring up today, big boy?" <laughs> and he'd laugh, he'd giggle. <laughs> and he's like, "Wait till you Yo, see yeah. this one." He's like, "I got something," and he'd come over, you know, and. Uh, I just like to I like to mess with them a little bit. But yeah, I'd always be available and talk. I I I tried to talk on game days and then I figured, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that. So I stopped doing it on game days, but I was always accessible. I was, you know, I love to sit in the room too after practice and with half my gear on and shoot the shit with teammates and Yeah. A lot of guys there. you talk about too are like coaches now. Like we went to Berkey talk a lot of guys I mean, you go to the draft, it must be crazy for you. You played with half the guys at the goddamn draft. I played with, I played with everybody. <laughs> yeah, I think I played on down the street. nine I, different teams. I, I wanted to ask you, I saw you played with Monty in Philly, the AHL yeah. team. Did you was did you know he'd be a great coach when you played with him? I didn't, to be honest with you. He was a guy that challenged Billy all the time. Like, Monty had an opinion. That was the one thing about him. He was, he was opinionated, and he wasn't afraid to share it. He was bold, and he was confident. Like that guy was confident. Like he had won at UMaine. They won a national championship. He played with Paul Correa. I remember like watching him like when I was in high school. I was like, holy shit, you know, like and he he had that confidence. I mean, if he's probably four inches taller. Or if it was now. Yeah. He was a good player. Like our fans team was sick. And 
we had great offensive players. We would either outscore teams or we'd beat people up. That's That mm-hmm. was what we were. And Monty was just a, I just thought he was a great American League player who just probably needed either five or six more teams to come into the league or the rules to change, and he probably yeah. would have played. Great hockey mind, offensive player. Um, not a shock that he's doing great now. I mean, because I, he's got that confidence. But I didn't know that he'd be a coach. I, I thought maybe he'd be like, I could see him being an agent. You know, yeah. representing guys and fighting against GMs and yeah. stuff. Did yeah. you ever think you'd coach though? You, you name it all these guys. Like these yeah. guys are all on coaching. I did personality coach. I, I coach youth hockey. People. I coach youth hockey. I went yeah. three for three. We'll get there too. Oh, I want to ask you about that. Oh, yeah. no. Quebec Pee Wee tournament. Yeah, you went to Quebec. I went to Quebec Pee Wee tournament. Yeah, I just yeah. did that. It's yeah. awesome. Isn't it great? It's awesome. It's the best. We, uh, yeah, no, I, I never. I, I when I I wanted to get into like maybe goalie development or something like that at yeah. the start, but there wasn't an opportunity, and then something popped up for TV and I said, I'll give this a shot. And one thing led to the next and that, that ship sailed unless Jonesy's yeah. looking for yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. Special yeah. Advisor. another advisor, advisor somewhere, you know, special advisor to yeah. the advisor. Yeah. <laughs> did did uh, you start as the intermission guy or were you right into between the benches? Uh, I did studio, a studio to start studio at the and I did flyers studio. I actually started in the minors. I, I went and did the American league Lehigh Valley Phantoms my first year. I like for 300 bucks a game, I drive up to Allentown and do color. I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. And uh, I did that Flyers studio and that led to NHL network. And then that led to NBC. And and I think Jonesy along the way was always the one that was pushing yeah, for me best. to, to yeah, awesome. he's a great, he did that great for teammate. me too. Jonesy, great teammate. When I came in there, NBC sometimes like I puppy dogged him around. Yep. He's such a great teammate. Yep. It's like, I, who doesn't like that guy? Oh, yeah. he's, the man. No, I know. he's an unbelievable person. We got to bring up the 2010 Flyers, obviously. Yeah. Now, you got, you got hurt during the Bruins, the comeback, right? Or, I did. Yeah. What what was it? Game game three or game four? Game five, I got hurt. And, so, and that was Michael Layton's first game that he was back. And uh, I he I got I, I my, my D-man pushed a player on top of me, and I was reaching for a puck. I was in a butterfly, mm-hmm. and I couldn't get my legs out from under me. And it was the first ever documented uh, – Two MCL sprain, like I sprained At both. Once? Yes, both wow. MCLs. I yeah. I, no, it happened to Mary. somebody. Anton Forsberg. It happened to this year. That's the second ever. But um, I thought I blew both my knees out. The, I, the trainer was came out and I told him, Jimmy McCross. And I was like, Jimmy, it's over. I was like, my <laughs> career is over. He's like, all right, well, let's just get you up off the ice here, Boucher. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's in double knee braces the next day. <laughs> I thought you had that too, Best. Did you have? I, I no, I yeah. tore both my ACLs in my last year. Not at the same time though. That's pretty special <laughs> that you did that. Yeah. And uh, like Forrest Gump with those fucking things on. <laughs> yeah. run, Forrest, run. I guess I go. I want to ask him one one thing too. Now, hockey dad, your yeah. son doing really well. Surgery, getting better, healing up. Yeah. Any advice for me? I got a thirteen year old going through it right now, or anyone listening? Don't be watching. a psychopath. Yeah, through this whole thing, your kid, you know, got I guess, you know, to where you want to go. Yeah. So far through his career. Um, Everyone's in a big rush. Parents are crazy. Anything for 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 those people. I would tell you to uh, pump your kid up. Yeah, make him make him believe in himself. Don't be too hard on him because when you get to a certain point, there's going to be people that tell you that you suck. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a good point. And there's no reason why you should do it. You know, you just just be supportive and love him and tell him that he's doing great. You know, and you got his back. I think that's the most important thing because. These kids today, all of them, like you know, the kids so are getting, much pressure. Kids right? that are getting drafted. Like this, there's so many people evaluating them, breaking down their game, and telling them what their flaws are. More social media, too, yeah, it's easier access. It's to crazy, see all and even shit. when they're young too. Like your kid went through this. I'm sure you tried to get them to play like other sports and everything. I know yep. we preach this to kids and stuff now because it's so specialized. Um, but even especially so young now because it is that way. Yep. Like it's a it's a three hundred and sixty. Well what sucks about it is I was t- I had this conversation the other day with somebody. It's like, all right, yeah, don't be playing hockey all year. You gotta do other things. But then like everyone is playing hockey all year. So it's up. like it, it, you're like you battling. Feel like you feel like you, you can't you have you to keep up. You gotta fall so, so it's yeah. like it, it, it's awkward, but I, I like what you mentioned in terms of support, but I also want wonder. And I remember my dad, he never he played like high school hockey, but I remember he said, you want to be in the NHL? He said, you just got to understand, like, it's not, it's not what you, it's not what you think it is. Like you think, yeah, it's your dream, but it's a lot harder than you think in terms of how difficult it can be mentally. So like, I'm sure you've told your son, like, 
pro hockey's hard, right? Like yeah. every kid has this dream, but you don't understand the, the aspect of the, the injuries and, and the getting sent down and things where I, I wonder if you've told him like, it's a lot different than you think it is, right? He's living it now. Yeah. I mean, he's had adversity. And I That's think, good, you though. know, for these kids that, you know, especially let's say national program kids, right? They, they're they told they're the best players in the country and they're, they're, you know, everybody tells them how great they are and, you know, they're put on a pedestal and, and I think they really believe it. But, you know, when you get to pro hockey, like you said, it's hard. You know, you're going to, at some point, you're going to have adversity and how do you, how do you blow through that? Mm-hmm. And he's dealing with it right now. I think everybody has to fail. I think it's great. Yep. You know, you don't, I don't think you fail. I think you just learn lessons along the way and if you can stay with it and push through on the other side you know just remember there's probably 99 percent of the people out there want to see you fail yeah. because they're all they're all sick in the head especially when you you're know especially I mean? they're all haters you hey, know what especially I mean? so, when your last name's boucher and your dad played in the nhl yeah, but it's anybody or, it could be your kid it's yeah. gonna be it's gonna be armstrong in, in yeah. six in five years you know what yeah. i mean it's gonna be it's you know it could be anybody mm-hmm. they just want to see somebody it's you know tr- it's crazy and it's a, that and nobody knows the support system that a lot of these guys have to have at this level you know from yeah. family to friends to help get them through because it unless you studied everybody's situation they all I'll go through adversity yeah. almost everybody i mean who who starts here and just climbs right to the top and wins the stanley cup and everything's great like well what at some point me, there's injuries that you got to get through and nobody ever pays attention to yeah. those times yeah. what happened to me kind of happened later for me like it never like i didn't really have adversity growing up high school college drafted and then it hits you and you're like wow like you kind of realize it's all going so easy and then when it hits it's a lot harder to deal with if you haven't had it before yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's true Guys, I hate all to right. do it. No, 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 oh, Boosh, thank you so much. This was awesome. This you're 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 great, great at what you do. killing it. Yeah. And we appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks guys. One of the best in the business. One of the yeah. best Thanks, in the guys. game. Thanks for having me. Keep crushing it. Hello, Canada. This episode is brought to you by the Scorebet Sportsbook and Casino. The Scorebet is the best sportsbook for the hockey obsessed. With a wide variety of markets and daily specials from us here at Spit and Chicklets, it's got you covered for everything on the ice. So if you're in Ontario only, download the Scorebet app and create an account today. You can build in follow your bets directly from the Score Sports app for the best possible experience. With the playoff push coming up, you don't want to miss anything. And the Scorebet also has you covered for all your other favorite sports and players, plus there's tons of iCasino games any day, anytime. That's the Scorebet. Download today and see how the best sports app, period, does sports betting. Please play responsibly. 19 plus. Ontario only. Gambling problem? Call Connex Ontario at 1-866-531-2600. Huge thanks to Bush for jumping on with us, man. Just a, a, a great guy. I've, I mean, I had only seen him on TV. I never actually met him and, and talked to him like that, but uh, just a funny bastard. Plus, G, even talking to him before and after the, the, uh, the interview. Of course, there's you know, some things we hear that don't necessarily make the air. So, uh, Bush, we need you back for part two. We still got a lot more to get to. So, uh, what else, G? What's going on uh, for, for the weekend, for the rest of the week with you? What, what's on tap? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually heading up to, so I got a little inspired last week when you were talking about your Vermont trip. I started thinking about the lakes and, you know, I got a little inspired. And uh, so I'm driving, I, it's going to be about five or six hours up to Lake Winnipesaukee, uh, where my parents, they got a boat up there. So a bunch of my friends got houses and very, very excited. And I, I can't wait for my first big deal brew on a boat. I can't, can't wait. There's no better big deal than like a big deal. You crack your first cold one of the day at like noonish on a boat. The, I don't like going too, too fast on the boat. I like just a nice cruise, a slow cruise. Can enjoy that beer. It's not floating in the wind. And the best thing is, is at like uh, Hannaford's has big deal brew in New Hampshire. There's Hannaford's everywhere around Lake Winnipesaukee. So Getting Big Deal Brews will be super easy and aimless plug here. BigDealBrew.com slash finder is where you can, BigDealBrewing.com slash finder is where you can uh, find where Big Deal Brewing is. And I'm just, I'm, I'm pumped to get up the lake. I'm pumped to have some big deals on the, uh, on the boat. And I'm just, uh, I don't want to say I'm a lake guy because I spent the past weekend at the, at the ocean, but man, I'm excited to get up to the lake. Yeah, it's uh, Lake Ocean. It's not an either or. It's water. You could do both. And I'm sure the folks in Manitoba, I know there's a few lakes up there. I'm sure they were enjoy- enjoying big deal brews. We dropped them up there last week. Uh, and also our folks in Ontario, we know there are tons of lakes there. We did restock Ontario lately. So like G said, bigdealbrewing.com slash find it. Check it out. See where you can get it near you, near your neighborhood. And if it's not in your state and you live by a state line, man, just drive over, grab it, check it out on the find to see where they have it. 
speaking of Ontario, RA, we're speaking of lakes, we're speaking of Ontario. No, it would be a blast. It would be a little like chiclet summer trip up to Lake Muskoka. We did the pond hockey tournament there a few years ago in, in Gravenhurst. And man, I, I've been I've been seeing some videos on on uh, Instagram and people's Snapchat stories of just them buzzing around Lake Muskoka. I think Kevin BX is up there and it just looks like the best place on earth. Like I've, I've never been in the summer. I've heard it's obviously much better in the summer than it is in the winter, but Man, with, how fun would that be? Just a, a full Chicklets team trip up there, do some boating activities, do some like tubing. That'd be a that'd be a blast. Uh, I've been dying to to do a, a Canadian Lake Muskoka great time in the winter, but I was like, oh man, this place must be a slobbernocker in the summer. And and what I noticed too, like you don't have to. It's not like down in Boston, you got to drive. You know, sometimes a few hours to get to you know Winnipesaukee or whatever whatever lake you might be going to. Between Toronto and London, there's like a zillion lakes within like forty five minutes you'd go to. Uh, it's like I Minnesota go, too. Yeah, yeah, land of ten thousand. Yeah, so I, I'm dying to get up to a uh, uh, Canadian lake. Probably not going to happen this summer, but yeah, especially uh, the the water's got to be a little bit chilly. I wake you right up in the AM. Can't wait. Uh, I'm well. I'm hitting my local Vermont lake next week. That's not the, like a Canadian lake, but I will be having some big deal brews up there. Got to stock up. Uh, Got to get another delivery before I take off for it too. Had a few the other night. I brought them down to the club for the boys for a little after hours. Brought down my my uh, what do you call it? Backpack cooler that I got hooked up with. That's a pretty sweet cooler, boy. That backpack, hey, that big deal backpack cooler is incredible, RA. We got to start selling those things. Those are unbelievable. I didn't realize it was a cooler until you just said that. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, unreal because I was like, you know me, I, I, was, I usually throw them like a shopping bag because I'm just showing up with the boys, but I'm like, oh my God, it's got to put the ice in there. I put a 12E in there, no sweat when I probably could have fit another 12 pack in there. Yeah, the boys ran out of pops, they didn't prepare. A little late night, I had my little, uh, Bose speaker brought the beers. I basically saved the boys for late night the other night. They had no beers left. I showed up. They were like, oh my God, Ari, this is some good stuff. I says, absolutely. So spreading the gospel about Big Deal Brew, baby, showing the boys what, what it's all about. So no uh, better late been- night beer than a Big Deal Brew, Ari. Yeah. Oh yeah. Nice and smooth. They go down pretty good, man. They whack them back pretty quick. Uh, let's see. We had a- another reminder. I know we mentioned it in the first half, Chicklets Cup registration. Uh, pre-sale is uh, on the 25th, which is... Uh, Tuesday, Tomorrow, wait. baby. Uh, well, today. So today, it's, it yeah. opens today, 2 o'clock for the pre-sale, and uh, Thursday, the 27th, 2 p.m., it open to the public. Like I said, get your teams together. It's going to sell out quickly. It's going to be a blast. You're not going to want to miss out. Yeah. Can't wait for some more Buffalo action. All right, gee, I almost wrapping up here. Anything else on the docket we got to get to or what? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Actually, before we wrap up, so we oh. have a producer here. He uh, His name's Fish. He's big into skateboarding, and he asked me a super interesting question before the podcast, and I guess some, some like uh, a, a crazy moment happened in the skateboarding world at X Games this past week, and Fish brought up this really good question, and he asked it to me before the pod, and I was like, we got to ask R.A. that on the pod. So, Fish, why don't you pop on here and ask that question? All right. So, all right, my question for you, it is around what happened this weekend. So X Games this weekend in California. Back in 2003, Tony Hawk, legendary skater, retired from skateboarding. This was four years after he landed his historic 900 in the vert ramp. 20 years later, he ends up joining the rotation in skaters at X Games, where he is also a commentator, skating in vert ramp best trick. So my question for you is, what current or former player in the NHL could take the longest break from competition and still come back and be dominant. Wow, it's a good um, question, I mean, right? The, the first name to come to mind is is Yarmir Yeager because he 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 did take some late career breaks and come back. Uh, obviously, you know his, his speed slowed down, whatever. But I'm trying to think of someone other than him. And I Ar- think it was, Ar- I said Mario yeah. just because Mario took a, a few years off, came back, was very dominant. Not 20 years, but Mario was the first one I could think of. And I mean, I think like. Connor McDavid, I'm sure when he retires, he'll be able to come back and play. And a guy like Sidney Crosby, I'm sure when he retires, he'll be able to come back and be dominant and play. But 20 years, that's that's fucking nuts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's someone who, I mean, even if they retired early in the early 30s, you're talking about a 52-year-old guy. I would think someone who, with some real speed, like a, like a Mike Gardner type, 700 goal scorer, he, he had speed to burn back then. He probably could skate a little bit. But yeah, that, that's a long time layoff, man. Let me jump in here. So I have another name I just thought of that I think could do it. And it's Ray Whitney, the wizard. I just, we've seen wizard a couple of times since he's retired. He looks fucking incredible. I feel like his style of play would have translated well to the way the game is trending. 
I don't know. I feel like Ray Whitney would just, I feel like he could strap him up right now, go play on a line with Bergeron and Marchand and put up 20. That's a great answer. He was a speedy guy too. And I saw a picture of him recently online, he, no shirt on. The Wiz has been taking care of himself since he retired. So gee, gee, that's a, that's a great guess. And uh, Speaking of shirtless guys, then Rod uh-oh. the Bod. Rod the Bod could definitely step in the NHL right now and play. That's another good no guess. question. Yeah. What about a goalie? Ooh. Uh, again, I guess it depends how, how much they stayed in shape. But uh, Patrick Waugh, I mean, uh, throw him out there. He's been retired. Yeah, actually, yeah, 2003, Minnesota uh, Wild. Actually, it was Andrew Brunette scored the last goal ever on Patrick Waugh, 2003 playoffs. So he's been out for 20 years as of this year. So I would, yeah, I, I think if, as long as he's, you know, if he took care of himself, was in somewhat shape, those skills are there, man. You know, it might be a little bit rusty, but yeah, Patrick Wild would probably be my guess. As, as, far a, as goalie, a goalie, I'm saying Dominic Hasek, just because those Euros, they keep themselves in great shape. I just, I feel like Hasek could jump in there and, you know, he could sneak out a shutout. He could pull a shopping cart full of goalie pads into the, <laughs> to the, to the rink. <laughs> exactly. Uh, shit. And uh, dude, to- one thing on Tony Hawk, man, that, that head hit, that, con- that back concussion, man, I, I was astounded at how, how many lumps that guy took, but that one concussion, man, I had to like, shut the thing off for a minute. It was brutal. So, all right, that's it. That'll do for episode 454. Hopefully you enjoyed. Brian Boucher will be back again next week with another fantastic interview. In the meantime, have a fantastic week, everybody.